I hope everyone has a comfortable seat. I did bring along the book to read. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not going to read the entire book. Matter of fact, I'm going to defer 79 out of the 80 chapters. And I'm going to read a portion of one of those chapters. It contains 80 chapters, and they're really short stories by the author. And it's a lot of us, his adventures as a child growing up, and also probably some misadventures that uh, went along with that. The author is Patrick F. McManus, one of America's favorite humorous outdoor writers. He had several best-selling books, plus for several years he wrote for Field and Stream magazine. He had a, a one-page article every week. He grew up on a small farm in Idaho, and his father passed away when he was only six. But the family rallied together and managed to, to keep the farm by raising chickens, pigs, cows, a few cash crops. They basically lived on what they could raise, plus whatever he could get hunting and fishing. I partially chose him because it relates so much to the story of my dad, whose father passed away at the age of 13. My dad was 13, and dad inherited the farm and managed to keep it in the family, and it's still in the family to today. And also, he has a lot of stories of that relate to me growing up on a farm myself and all the adventures I had with my cousins and neighbors and all the great exploration we did in our four-year woods. The stories are sometimes referred to as fabrications. It's great storytelling ability and it significantly enhances the experience. Let's take a quick walk through one of his stories. And because of the length, I'll, I've cut and pasted a little bit out of the story. This story is Grogan's War Surplus. My old camping buddy Wretch, his eyes dreamy and wet with nostalgia, leaned forward and stirred the fire under our sizzling pan of trout with a stick. I could tell he was getting deep into his cups because that's the only time he turned sloppily sentimental. Also, we were cooking on a propane camp stove. And that, that little bit comes into play a few times throughout the story that there, all this is occurring around a Coleman stove. You know, it seems like only yesterday that you and I were crouched in the mud in some godforsaken place with our bayonets to roast a couple hunks of spam over some canned heat. Yeah, the heating of our water in our steel helmet, I said, and lying awake at night in a pup tent, listening for the first sound of the attack. Half our gear riddled with bullet holes, Ratch put in, Shaking a tear off the end of the mustache, shaking a tear off the end of his mustache. Yep, we really had some great camping when we were kids. He said, Ray, or Rex said, what was that animal that was always attacking us in, in those days? I'm not sure what it was called, I said, but they were always big and hairy and had red eyes and teeth the size of railroad spikes. I haven't seen one of them since I was 12 years old. I leaned over and stopped Rex from throwing another log on our fire. Not at least when I'm sober. You remember old Grogan's <coughs> War Plus Store Plus Store? Why I remember Grogan's War Surplus Store? Why, name only, made my heart dance the light fantastic. Grogan's War Surplus, ah, I could never forget. Immediately after World War II, Grogan had remodeled an old livery stable and feed store in a style now referred in the architectural textbooks as War Surplus Modern, a decor that attempts to emulate the aesthetic effects of a direct hit on an Army ordnance base. On the lot behind the store, the plundered wreckage of a dozen or so military vehicles had been cleverly arranged in such a manner to conceal what had once been an unsightly patch of flowers. But all the really precious stuff was kept inside the store itself, illuminated by a few naked lights and the watchful eyes of the owner, Henry P. Grogan. The great thing about Grogan's War Surplus Store, not only did you get every conceivable thing you might possibly use for camping, but it was cheap. With a few dollars and a sharp eye for a bargain, you could go into Grogan's outfit yourself with at least a bear bare essentials for a routine one-night camping trip, such as 
a sleeping bag, pup tent, canteen, cook kit, an entrenching shovel, paratrooper jump boots, leggings, pack board, pack sack, web belt, ammo pouches, medic kit, bayonet, steel helmet, a liner for that helmet, a 45 automatic caliber holster, empty, a GI can opener, and a GI soap, plus other bare essentials. Naturally, you never took all of that gear for one simple overnight trip. Nine times out of ten, you'd forget the soap and maybe the can opener. Since one of the rules of backpacking requires that all non-essentials be omitted from the pack, we strained our imaginations to bring every last piece of beloved war supplies into the realm of necessities. Take the bayonet, for example. It was needed for cutting and spearing things. Frequently, it cut and speared things we really didn't want to cut and spear, but it still outweighed value. The machete was needed any time you had to slash out your own trail. The necessity arose more often than a person who was not a kid with a machete would think. Over the years, we slashed out nearly hundreds of trails through the wilderness. The longest of these was the Great Rocky Mountain Divide Trail. It was never used much by backpackers, but the mother of a friend of mine who lived at the jumping off point later put up a post at each end of the trail and strung a clothesline in between. The other trails were not nearly as magnificent. You had to be a shrewd shopper not to get taken by Henry P. Grove. We really realized that some of the war stuff, surplus stuff was brand spanking new. Other merchandise had obviously seen the combat. It was cracked, tarnished, stained, ripped, riddled, rotten, rusty, and moldy. Frequently, Henry P. would try to pawn off some of that new stuff, but we weren't going to be fooled. We held out the authentic war surplus. Oh, you can't imagine how old Henry P. would roll his eyes and gnash his teeth every time one of us kids outputted him like that. Shrewd as I was, Henry P. managed to take me even a few times. One of the worst things he did was sell me what he called one of those down bags used by Arctic troops to keep them comfortable in 70 below weather. The bags turned out to be a secret weapon of the War Department, designed to be dropped behind enemy lines in hopes that enemy troops would attempt to sleep in them and either freeze or break out the itch that would occupy both hands scratching for the duration of the war. The stuffing was not of down but chicken feathers. In the size of the lumps in the bag is any indication Several of the chickens were still attached. But the worst feature of the bag is it triggered by its getting even slightly wet. Anytime it rained on one of the camping trips, I went home smelling like high tide at the local chicken or turkey farm. Another time, Henry, he enticed me to buy a two-man mountain tent, so-called. I later discovered, because it was heavy as a mountain and took two men to set it up. <laughs> the roof of the tent would have been made out of dried bat skin and was impervious to everything but wind, rain, or heavy dew. As well as the drawbacks of the mountain tent, I was constantly on the lookout for some kind of portable shelter that would afford me a bit more comfort and protection. One day, poking around with Grogan's horse surplus, I found it. After sorting through the ever-present snarl of nylon rope, I discovered a canvas tube attached to a dry bat skin and mosquito netting. The mosquito net on one side had a zipper running the full length of it. What is it? I asked Rogan. That, my boy, is a jungle hammock. Not having any jungle readily available, I inquired as to how it would work in our part of the world. Just fine. For example, there are some folks who don't much care for slimy, crawly old snakes sneaking into their nice, cozy, 70 below down sleeping bags to get warm. They like it here, they like this here jungle hammock because it keeps them out of reach. All the poisonous critters. I didn't let on the slightest with Grogan, but he had referenced my kind of people. 
I lost no time in getting the jungle hammock home and suspended between two trees in our backyard for a trial run. It looked so secure, suspended up there a mere 10 feet off the ground, and I decided to spend the night there. I climbed a stepladder to launch myself into my maiden voyage in the hammock. I zipped up the mosquito netting, wiggled into my chicken down sleeping bag, and lay back contemplating the closing of my ancient enemy darkness. After four or five hours of this contemplation, an unnerving thought occurred to me. I had not remembered to have the stepladder removed. It continued to connect the ground and hammock like a boarding ramp for any ravenish beast that happened along. I leaned over to kick the ladder. As I did so, the hammock flipped on the side, sending me like a shot through the mosquito netting, still enhanced in case in my sleeping bag. As bad luck would have it, my crotchety old dog, Strange, had collapsed on the target area. Nothing in his experience, of course, had taught him to expect me even to be out at night, let alone suspended in the air ten feet above him. Consequently, when a large screeching shape wrapped in chicken feathers plummeted down on him in the darkness, it was certainly reasonable for him to assume that a fall, he had fallen prey to a huge carnivorous bird of the night. I, for my part, fully expected to be greeted by a hairy beast with fast snapping jaws as, he, as, the expectation, as that expectation did not go unfulfilled. Both of the smell of wet chicken feathers for days afterwards. It was a full week before I could brush the taste of dog off my teeth. After I recovered from that night, though, I couldn't help chuckling over how I put over one on old Henry P. If he had known the mosquito netting in that jungle hammock was eaten plumb through with jungle rot, he would have charged me twice the price. Do I remember Henry P. Grogan's war surplus store? I said to Wretch. Wasn't this the high class place with a sign that said, Shirts and shoes must be worn on these premises? But he didn't hear me. He was too busy blowing on the fire. Let me share a story or two related to some things a little bit like his misadventures or fabrications. <clears throat> I was fairly young. My cousins and I decided we were going to build an ocean going raft. Our plan, we'd start out at our local river, sail it down through the Great Lakes, St. Lawrence Seaway, right out to the ocean. We went, we spent days building this, this raft that was going to take us, the three of us, out to the ocean. Finally, on about the third or fourth day, we took it down to the Raging River. And the Raging River was one within a half a mile of our house because we were only 12 years old. We couldn't uh, be out past dark. Apparently, Two old wooden fence posts and a sheet of plywood don't support three young sailors. It sunk immediately. Fortunately, it was one for all and all for one. We abandoned ship and started making our way for shore. Fortunately, <coughs> we used the, the Navy and the Marine motto, no man left behind. We all finally struggled to the beach and lay down in the sand thanking our lucky stars we'd survived. It wasn't long before we were attacked by a large group of thousand pound black and white critters determined to get to that river. We jumped up and we fought them off as best we could. But as it turned out, we were just so overwhelmed by numbers that we decided that that effort was futile. We give up the battle and allowed Dad's cows down to the crypt to drink. <laughs> we ended up never making it out of the Great Lakes, but we did sail that, that pontoon, that raft, a good six or eight feet before it sunk. And probably the best thing was we all made it back to shore safely. Because at that time of the year, that raging river slash drainage ditch can be as much as a foot deep in places. We survived. Another adventure my cousins and I had was we went up to stay at one of their aunt and uncle's cabins up on Higgins Lake. We arrived 
and quickly realized their emergency key wasn't where it was supposed to be. We thought, what are we going to do? We got three days up here. We elected to, to go ahead and break in the cabin, break the lock, we fix it when we left. Unfortunately, for three days, we had no lights, no water, no bathroom. Higgins Lake served as our bathing, our bathroom, and our drinking water. Not, maybe not in that order. So we finally fixed the lock and headed home on the third day. We pulled in and started talking to their aunt and uncle, and they were almost beside themselves. We fixed the lock as best we could. I think it'd be all right. We started describing the cottage and how nice it was. They kind of had a blank look. Finally, they realized we were on the wrong street the whole time. I believe the statute of limitations has ran out on that. <laughs> and I would tell you about the smell of drinking, but I think I'll defer that to another occasion. Thank you.